If people actually started to be the people of the way, started to live the dream that's placed in them, because when you start to live that dream and apply that, everything changes. People start looking at it and go, you are different. Why are you so happy? Why are you so excited about life? Why aren't you in the doom and gloom of everything that's going on? Because I don't live in that space. I live in Christ. I live out of the dream that's within me. I am a spiritual being that's clothed with flesh for a season to fulfill the Father's dream. That's what it's about. That's what Jeremiah is all about. And that's what this series is all about. It's becoming a dream releaser. But you can't release a dream in someone else until you've got the dream yourself. Now, someone was very astute and realised that I am using a portion of Scripture out of the Old Covenant. And she said, surely that is only to Jeremiah and to Israel. And I said, you know what? The Word of God is all inspired. It's all inerrant. It's all authoritative. It's just not all applicable. You've got to understand what parts are applicable and what aren't. So let's have a quick look at this verse because our foundational verse. Let's read the verse and have a look and just see um, how you can see this is for Israel but could be applicable to us now. So it's Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. It says, Before I formed you in the womb, right? So he's used the context, before I formed you in the womb. Now, is that only relevant to Jeremiah? No, pretty much everybody comes that way. You know, before you were born, people born, yeah, absolutely, I set you apart and I appointed you. So this is an old covenant scripture, but you can see passed through the cross, thinking about Jesus' death, burial and resurrection on the other side. Is there any evidence that we come into the world, into this world via the womb and being born? Yes. So it's applicable, not just to Jeremiah. However, in the midst of this, is something that is applicable only to Israel. And that's this part. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. He was a prophet to the nations. He spoke on God's behalf to Israel to try and get them to stay on track and stop becoming like the pagan nations. There were other prophets. They all spoke. They all spoke until Jesus came. John the Baptist was the last prophet and Jesus was the fulfilment of it. So we are not... Prophets to the nations anymore. Some people discovered a very important lesson when they tried to prophesy something to the nations around the election. Very embarrassing. Very embarrassing because God's not doing that anymore. We are now appointed to be ministers of reconciliation, to help people like Christian come back into a relationship with Christ for themselves. That's what we're about. So as you can see, you can read an old covenant of Israel and sometimes there's stuff that's applicable and comes through and sometimes it's not. And you need the Holy Spirit within you to discern what does and what doesn't. So this is our foundational verse. This is what I kicked this off with. God, this is, the implication of this, if you get this, is phenomenal. It means before you even made a transition to this world, God knew you, which means that He created you. He designed you Even before you were conceived in God's divine design room, there's a design and he set you apart and he knew you and he appointed you. That changes everything about how we should think about life, how we think about finding a life partner, what's important in life. It changes everything. His design is perfect. But I mentioned a few weeks back that sometimes we have manufacturing faults, you know, because human beings, we are... birthed in sin, it's in our bodies, it's there, it actually causes brokenness. Sometimes in the manufacturing process, when God partners with your mum and dad to get you here, some things go wrong. And someone said to me the other day, I was walking around and Anne was with me and they came up and they said, hey, I heard your message. I said, oh yeah. He said, what's your manufacturing fault? (laughs) And I said, I had to think. And I thought, and I thought, and I thought, no, I got nothing. And then my wife chirped in and said, would you like me to help you on that? Because I know all your manufacturing faults. But I've got them, you've got them. And if you think you've got some bad ones, here. Six months of age, twisted bowel, nearly died. Rheumatic fever, two years of age, nearly died. Kidneys shut down full at age nine, nearly died. 15, paralyzed from the waist down, having to learn to walk all over again, left with the massive back issue that even to this very day, I have to do at least an hour to an hour and a half of some kind of exercise and stretching or I just seize up. 
So when it comes to manufacturing faults, I've got some, like you've got them, but it's not excuse to not to discover that divine design that's there. And you've got to go down, you've got to discover it, you've got to <clears throat> press down, press in and figure out what it is, put some energy and effort into it. And um, if you haven't been here across this season, I'd encourage you to go download the app and just watch it because this is about being a dream releaser. It's finding what's the thing in you that God has placed there before you even got here and then releasing it, not to be just a blessing for you, but to be a blessing for people around you and to fulfill his plan and purpose. So I wanna stick around today and go one final thing because in this particular one, if you don't do this, <clears throat> if you don't do this, it actually ends up becoming null and void. Now, when I was a teenager, I told you, I did lots of sport. I love sport. I was really into it. I think I mentioned to you, I did soccer. And so I spent a fair bit of time playing soccer. Um, you can't actually see in this one here, but I have a beard in here at 15. I went holidays to England. I came back, I had a beard. It was amazing. And the te- it started a fight in the school. The teacher said, no, he can keep it. And some said, no, he can't. And anyway, dad made me leave school then and go and bricklay. So it made no difference. So I, I, was, I was right into sport. Now, I know there are some of you here, there are some of you here that think that the greatest, the greatest contribution that I have to our church is not my theological prophetic teaching. It's not my servant heart. It's not my love for the people, but it's actually my calf muscles. It's my calf muscles. During the week here when I'm working around, I work in shorts and people go, man, you've got amazing calves. And I'm thinking, anything else or is that just it? Why? I did this, but then I also did motocross. I told you I did motocross for years and I used to race and that once again helps the calf muscles. But beyond that, you would know I was actually an athlete. I used to run, I used to sprint, and this is all pre-15 when everything changed. I used to do the 100, 200, and 400. And I was pretty good at it. I was pretty fast. And when I was preparing for this, I said, I need to help people understand this about what I'm gonna share. And I text my mother and I said, Mum, is there any chance that you have my starting blocks from when I was 13, 14 years of age? And then I went on in the text and say, Mum, the correct answer is no. <laughs> but I thought I would ask anyway. 10 minutes later, she sends me a photo and I have them right here. When I was 13, these are the starting blocks that I was running on a tartan track it was QE2 Stadium then. That's where I won the 100, 200, and the 400. These are 47 years old. Mama, let it go. <laughs> 47 years old. And it's like, I wonder what else is stored up there in that cupboard. I, I dread to fear what's in there. But here's the deal. I did all these kind of sports. There's a lot of training goes into running. The amount of rehearsing you've got to do of getting in the blocks and firing off and trying to get those calf muscles really working for you so you can get out quick and you've got to watch what you eat and you've got to watch your weight and you've got to run, you've got to do endurance, you've got to do all this kind of stuff for less than 12 seconds on the track. It's all over in under a minute, even at the 400. It's like, what is going on? But here's the deal. Here's the deal. What happens... What would happen if I did all that training and I never got on the starters blocks? What happens if I never did that? I never got off the blocks and I never got in the race. It would be useless. It's exactly the same. You can know the design is there by God. You can dig down there, you can press in, you can get it, get down to it. But if you don't deploy it, you have to deploy it. Now, I know some of you are worried because you wanted to see if I really did run. There is a photo up here of something of me by the billiard table holding the shield in a white stripey shirt or something like that. I don't know if they've got it. But that was it. But you have to deploy. You cannot just let it sit there. To know is not enough. Now, I just was, as I was preparing this, I thought, I wonder how many of you have trained for something, have planned for something, have worked for something, but you just not stepped into the blocks. I can see someone right in my vision right now. I can imagine you're really sweet on this girl, this relationship. And so you change your hairstyle, you get some cool glasses, start listening to the music she likes, start eating what she likes, all that kind of stuff. But you never make the ask. If you never make the ask, it's going nowhere. 
I know people that have got ideas for business. They build everything in the background. They've actually got websites that aren't even up there yet and they plan the whole thing out, but they won't deploy it. People that are writing books and they're writing books. This book is gonna be bigger than Lord of the Rings. Are you ever gonna deploy it? You have to deploy it at some stage. Oh, but what if I fail? But what if you succeed? Oh, but what if I fail? But what if you succeed? But what if I fail? You know, you're a real glasses, half empty kind of person. You know that? It's the same with this designer dream. Knowing it's not enough. Digging down deep to get to it's not enough. You've got to deploy it. The amount of dreams that are sitting in the body of Christ that God could use to transform a city is incredible but it's sitting idle because nobody is deploying it. You know, I think, I think the richest place on earth is not the diamond mines of South Africa. It's not the Inca gold in Ecuador or the oil fields in Arabia. I think the richest place on planet earth, if I could mine it, is the graveyard. It's the graveyard. Sometimes I actually wander around graveyards weird, huh? Not late at night. But I wonder, and I look and I go, I wonder how many dreams have gone to the grave because someone was not courageous enough to deploy it. I wonder how many. My mentor, Pastor Wayne Cadero of of New Hope, he actually designed this soap journal. He's a fantastic man and a great mentor. He has a philosophy of life and it's this, die empty. He said, die empty. He said, I aim to give the grave nothing but an empty carcass. He said, when I I go, he said, I want left on the screen of my life, around there on the headstone, empty, nothing left, out of gas. He said, I aim to expel everything. And he tries to encourage the church. Friends, you have to expel everything. You have to deploy. Don't hold it back. You've got to get on the starting blocks and you've got to start running. And I know our greatest fear is that we'll fail. I failed running on the blocks. I can't tell you how painful it is to pop a hammy out of the blocks. That really hurts. You don't get very far. But you've got to be willing to take a few hits and you've got to be willing to fail and you've got to be willing to step out there because failure are only the stepping stones to actually the destination of success. If you're not prepared to fail, you cannot get anywhere. You can't get off the blocks. So you've got to do it. Now, fortunately, God knows that we struggle with this. He knows you're going to struggle with it. So he actually had Jesus teach into this particular thing because he knows that we have a hesitation to deploy, to deploy. And so Jesus is motivating us, but what I want to warn you about is that what you're about to see of Jesus' teaching is extremely confronting, extremely confronting. And if you're sitting here and you go, I haven't decided whether I'm going to make a decision for Christ, this might cause you to just wait for a little while longer because it is very, very challenging. It's out of the book of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew is the 13th disciple that made it into the 12th disciple when the one on whom we do not speak about blew out of the water. It's the one you don't name your kids after, you know. He he ended up getting in that way. And Jesus is talking to them about the kingdom of heaven because they're all thinking, Israel was always thinking kingdom. We want another Joshua to come and be an army. We want to get out there and dominate the world again. He goes, no, no, it's not about that. My kingdom... My kingdom is different. It's very different. And he starts to tell these stories to help them understand what this kingdom's about. And Jesus is talking to them about this kingdom, about the expectations of the Father and what's going to transpire when he returns. And it's very, very, very confronting. The first parable in chapter 25 he talks about is actually in relation to five virgins, five wise, five unwise, and they have lamps that don't have enough oil. Oil in the scriptures always represents the Holy Spirit. And the first thing he does before he even gets to the main point is to say to them, you have to be continually engaged with the Holy Spirit. It's what Christian was talking about. The Holy Spirit has to be within and continually filling you. There's got to be a continual connection. Otherwise, you don't have the courage to get off the blocks. But then he moves along and he tells a story about a master that's giving some talents. Your Bible might say talents or is giving some bags of money. 
and he says, I'm going away. See, Jesus is trying to help them understand, I'm not gonna be here, I am actually going after my death, burial, and resurrection. But they, they, they didn't know that because they didn't have the benefit of the Bible. The Bible wouldn't come around for another 300 years. So they're kind of trying to piece this all together in amongst these stories. And he's talking about what's gonna happen upon his return. And if you read that chapter, and I encourage you to do that, you'll discover towards the end of it, Jesus says, I'm the one that's judging the nations. Now that's why you don't need prophets to the nations. That's my gig. And there's also another gig that I've got too, which I'm gonna share with you right now. So he's got this telling the story, it's about the kingdom and what's gonna happen, what's gonna transpire. This is how it goes. Matthew 25, verse 15, he said, and to one he gave five talents, to another he gave two talents, and another he gave one, each according to their own ability. See, there's that uniqueness. You've got a unique dream inside you, a unique designer dream. And according to your ability, you have been given a talent. And then he goes, he goes away on a journey. That's code for, after my death, burial, and resurrection, I'm out of here. But hey, I'm giving you some stuff. Now, what's interesting is they each have, according to their ability, the guy that gets five talents, he just goes like mad. He starts buying and selling and doing all sorts of stuff, and he he's goes to work. The one that's got two, he immediately goes to work, and he's doing all sorts of things, and he's having some fun with it. The one who got one, he just kind of oh, dug a hole and buried it and got on with his life. Now, the problem is, that the master is going to return and he's expecting a return on his investment that he's placed within them. So look at verse 19, it says, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came to do what? To settle accounts. Whoa. So he's gonna settle accounts about what he's given you. Whoa, okay, this is, this is a bit confronting. Now, so he's turned back up after a long time, he's gonna settle accounts. Mr. Five Town, he's eagerly waiting to get there. I can't wait to get there to the master, I'm gonna tell Jesus what I did. I had five talents, I went to work, I bought a business, that failed, but I put some more in here and I invested there. And eventually, look, I've got 10 talents now, I've doubled your money. And Jesus goes, wow, master goes, well done, good and faithful servant. Good and faithful servant, didn't say good and faithful leader, it's interesting, good and faithful servant, and he says, Enjoy, come, enjoy the presence of the Lord. Now, number two heard that the master's back, so he's ready to run in, and he's got his talents, and he's going, I took my two talents, and I went and bought some shares, and then I went and did this, and then I bought a block of land, and I went and worked it for a little while. I definitely stayed away from Bitcoin, but I still worked it, I still worked it, and I've doubled it. My two is four. Wow, that's amazing. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enjoy the master's rest. Okay, keep in mind, this is about the kingdom. Then, um, Mr. One Talent, you know what he's thinking? He's heard the master's back and he's going, holy shnike, he's weird that I bury that thing. He doesn't even remember where he's buried it. So he's gotta go and figure out where he buried the talent. And then he's gotta go and dig it up. And then, while he's digging it up, he's walking to the master and he must be thinking to himself, oh, I'm in so much trouble. I really need a good story. I have got to have a good story to get out of this one. I've got to have. So he's thinking up this story on the way and he thinks he's got a good story. And let's pick it up and see how well it goes with the master. So then it says, then he who received <clears throat> the one talent said, I knew you to be a hard man. This is great. So the master's thinking, so this is, this is your big plan. This is your excuse. It's my fault that you didn't do anything with your talent. So it's my fault you didn't do it? Oh, this is great, this is fantastic. And then he starts saying, you know, I know you're a hard man, you reap where you have not sown, and you gather where you have not scattered seed. Now he goes on and he says, hmm, so I was afraid and went and hid your talents in the ground. Look, here it is, here is what your talent is. I give it back to you. It's all nice and shiny and safe. This is your great plan? This is your great plan? That when Jesus returns, you're gonna blame it on him? And then, but it's because I know you're a tough, I've read the Old Testament, you're a tough God, you know? And I was afraid, so, okay. So let's see how this goes for the servant. But the Lord 
said to him, you wicked, lazy servant. Oh, hang on, hang on. No, 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 no. I said, you're tough. I've read the old covenant, you know. You're tough. I was afraid. No, 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 no. No, you're a wicked, lazy servant. Oh, okay. Um, And this is, I hate this. If you've ever had this done to you, you say something to someone and then they repeat it back to you and it's just awful. You hear your own words coming back and go, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Somebody goes, he goes, oh, okay, you wicked, lazy servant. He goes, no, 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 no. Oh, yeah, you knew that I do not reap where I have sown. So you knew that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you knew that you know, I gather where I haven't scattered seed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, this is bad. This is not going well. So then he goes on. So you ought to have at least deposited the money in the bank so I could have had a little bit of interest. The master used his own words against him. He thought he had a slick excuse. He said, tough guy, I'm afraid. No, you wicked, lazy servant. You could at least take the money down the bank. You, you, you couldn't even be bothered going to the bank. You just buried it in a hole in the ground. So he calls him out on it. And he settles the accounts. So there's a settling of the accounts. God expects a return on what he gives us, on how he gives us. That's why inside every human being is that designer dream. Now, I just wish it finished there. If it finished there, I'm, I can handle that. But he goes on. It's like he's not finished yet. He said, hmm, therefore, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. Well, that's not fair. I only got one. He's got 10. Yeah, but he did something with it. You did nothing with it. Take it off and take it over there. Wow, this is not good at all. Let's read on. For everyone who has, more will be given. So if you have and you use it, more will be given and he will have abundance. Yeah, you've got to put it to work. But him who does not have, even what he does have, will be taken away. Wow. Jesus just calls him out. He just calls him out and says, wow, you wicked, lazy servant. You did nothing with what I gave you. You just buried it. And now you're trying to make an excuse and you're blaming me for it? What Jesus is saying, that I was afraid is not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it when we stand before him. And if I wish he'd have stopped there because this next portion, if I, could, if I could tear this out of the Bible, I would tear it out. There's a few pages I'd like to tear out. This is one of them. This is one of them. Because it is so confronting what he says to the servant from here. He says, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. That can't be good. The unprofitable servant says, you're wicked, lazy. You did nothing with it. You just buried it. Where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. Remember, he's talking to them about the kingdom of heaven. He's telling them what the father's expectation is. He's telling them what's going to happen when he returns and Jesus does the, judges the nations. There's also the judgment seat of Christ for us to see what did you do with what I gave you? Is Jesus saying that if with what's given to us, if we don't use it and we don't deploy it, it can actually impact our futures? Apparently. This opens up a massive theological question in Pandora's box and it's ugly in there. And I don't have the time to go into the scope of it. But Jesus is implying that if you try and stand before him and say, well, I know you're a tough, you know, like, and I know you did this, that, and the other, I was afraid, it's not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it. He has an expectation. He's actually saying you can disqualify yourself. You can disqualify yourself. This is why knowing your dream, the designer dream, digging down to it and finding it is still not enough. You've got to hit the blocks. <clears throat> You've got to deploy it. Now, let me just balance this out with the grace of God. This is not talking to you and I that are trying to find our dream. We're digging down. We're trying to work things out. We're falling over. We fall into sin. We get back up. We ask forgiveness. We keep going. We're trying to pursue. We're opening up. We're trying to find it. We're trying to deploy it. And we're falling over. There is all the grace in the world for that and forever. 
but there's not for the one that deliberately rejects the command of what Jesus says, deliberately ignores it, what's given to him, and then carries on in life as if everything is just fine. I don't need God at all. I don't need that thing God gave me. I just carry on. That is when you can disqualify yourself. See, our point of this series is appointment with deployment. This is it for us. We have to deploy. We've got to deploy. Can't just know about it. Can't just dig around it and find it and then just keep it buried down there. You actually have to deploy it. And the whole thing about fear is not going to cut it. It's not enough to believe. It's not enough to persist and dig down there. You've actually got to deploy. And the reason why I was afraid doesn't stick is because the Holy Spirit has been given to you and the Holy Spirit has given you a powerful presence within you. You don't have a spirit of fear, which is why Jesus called him out for being lazy. If you have the presence of God in you, you don't have a spirit of fear. You have a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. But this is so important because if you, don't, if you don't deploy your dream, if you don't step out there and you don't let the Father play the sunset of Christ in you, you'll never be able to help someone else that's trapped follow Christ and play the sunset of Christ in them. The appointment is with deployment. That's why it says faith without what is dead? Faith without works. Now, you don't do the works to actually get your faith. That's not it. You're not earning your salvation No, no, your works come out of the fact that you are so in love with God and you are so passionate. You could hear that in Christian's voice before. You're so passionate about it. There's nothing left but you wanting to serve and wanting to fulfill everything. Could you imagine what would happen if every person that said they were Christ follower actually lived like this? They actually deployed the dream? They played the sunset? Man, this would be amazing. Things would transform. You transform cities again. In the first century, they were that passionate about Christ. They had that length, depth of relationship with Him. They were living their dream. They were deploying their dream. And Christianity exploded from like 12 guys through to 30, 40 million. Such a short period of time and they didn't even have a building at that point in time. Why? Because they deployed their faith. When every part of our life is filled with purpose and we're carried along by the Holy Spirit, everything changes. You experience joy like you've never experienced it before. And then what happens is God adds to the church daily. People come into Christ. You know what? You couldn't build enough junction points on the Gold Coast if people actually started to be the people of the way, started to live the dream that's placed in them. Because when you start to live that dream and apply that, Everything changes. People start looking at it and go, you are different. Why are you so happy? Why are you so excited about life? Why aren't you in the doom and gloom of everything that's going on? Because I don't live in that space. I live in Christ. I live out of the dream that's within me. I am a spiritual being that's clothed with flesh for a season to fulfill the Father's dream. That's what it's about. That's what Jeremiah is all about. It's amazing. And God is saying to us, the kingdom of heaven, it's like the master, goes away for a while, but he's coming back. He's going to settle accounts. He's going to ask you what you did with what I've given you. And to say, I was afraid, it's not going to cut it, I'm sorry. Not my words. His. I told you it was going to be confronting which is why we're going to finish off this series by having communion together. And some of the team are going to just distribute the communion. And for you guys uh, online, would you just grab some cracker or some juice? I just want us to remember this. Jesus went to the cross for us. His body was broken that we would have a body, the spiritual body of Christ to connect with. His blood was shed so that his blood would cleanse us from sin, past, present, and future. He's the one that enables us to live the Christian walk. He's the one that enables us to get on the blocks and run. Last week, at the end of our online experience, after we break from you guys, we have a time of just worship 
where we allow God to do whatever he wants to do to settle that message down. And I felt God speak to me and, and give me a word of knowledge about the fear of man. And I was, to be honest with you, I was a little bit taken back about how many people were struggling with this fear of man, fear of other people, and we got to worship together. But that's why the Lord wanted me to share with you his thoughts on that now because he's saying you don't have a spirit of fear. If you're operating out of a spirit of fear of people, you don't have the spirit of Christ within. You've got a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. That's what you have. If you're driven by fear and you won't be able to use that as an excuse, oh, well, I was afraid. No, no, no. You've got to. Got to deploy. As I said to you, Pastor Wayne Kadira is a great mentor to Anne and I and And uh, he's just such a wonderful, servant-hearted guy. And um, thank you. And he tells a story of when he was a little boy. uh, And he's been about teenage years. And he used to live in Japan because his dad was in the military. And they would... He would love going and they'd go for drives and he would look at how, how absolutely precise all of the rice paddies were. And it, was, it was so, and it was so green, it was so beautiful. And he said this day they went and they parked up on the side of the hill and they were looking out over and it was so magnificent. And he noticed this Japanese sensei sitting onto the side and he had this cage and in it was this beautiful little finches in these cages. And so the sensei kind of got his attention and he went across and uh, he looked at these little birds and he said, this is fantastic. And he said, uh, you want to buy a bird? And he goes, yeah, how much? 100 yen. Oh, that's all, 39 cents. That's all it was in those days, or 36 cents. So he bought this little finch in this cage. And then he was wait- making his way back to the car when the sensei called him back. Oi, Daniel, come back here. So he called him back. And he came back across and he said, um, bring cage back when you're finished. And he thought... Bring cage back, it's my pet. I'm not going to eat it. You know, what am I going to do? And he was, he was full of attitude as a young teenager. And he goes, no, daniel son, you bring cage back. You misunderstand. You, by bird, wish you take to cliff and set free. And he thought, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But he said that the sensei was so uh, absolute about it that in the end he decided to comply just in case he knew some kind of slick karate moves. Anyway, he went to the, he went to the, to the edge and he had the, the, the bird in the cage there and uh, um, he opened the cage door and the bird just sat there. So he tapped on the cage and it kind of jumped a little bit and then he tapped again and it jumped a little bit more. <laughs> he tapped for the third time, got right to the edge and then it deployed and he said this thing just, it just, it was almost like it danced. It, sang everywhere, whistled everywhere, it was in the trees and it was, he said it was the most amazing thing he'd ever seen. And then it was like it came back and it kind of looked at him as much as to say thank you for freeing me. And he said, I learnt something then. What he didn't know is it's probably trained and went straight back to the sensei and he sold it again. But that's a different story. He said, I learnt something in that moment. And he said that was his calling the pastor of church and he said, I've spent my entire life tapping on people's cages, helping them to fly, releasing them and freeing them. And so as you're holding this this morning, this is what this whole dreams series is about, is about you remembering how much God loves you, how much he has placed in you. Yes, he expects a return on it. He wants you to use it, not just for your benefit and for your family's benefit, but also for his dream, because there are people out there that are trapped in cages everywhere and they're waiting for someone to come tap on there and encourage them to step out of the cage. You can do this. You have a design in you that is there specifically by God. Yes, you're gonna have to dig down. Yes, you're gonna have to face some things and you're gonna have to deploy it. So I want everyone just to close their eyes for a moment. And I wanna just sing something over you out of Galatians 2.20, just to help you really understand what this is all about. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. 
It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. He lives, he lives, Jesus is alive in me. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. That's what it means to be a dream releaser. As you're holding the communion now, I want you to eat and drink as you feel led to eat and drink. And I want you to think about where are you as I'm tapping on the cage and the Holy Spirit is tapping on the cage. Where are you? Are you reached the place where you've surrendered your life to Christ and I know the dream is there? Are you at the next tap where it's like, man, I need to face some ugly things about myself. I'm trapped by the things that have happened to me in my past and I'm going round and round in circles. You'll go round and round and die in the wilderness. You've got to dig down to get to that hidden image of God that's there. Or is it the final tap? You just got to deploy. You have not got a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And God says, deploy it, because that is what will make all the difference. Let's eat and drink together. Father, please help us to remember that you are the unique designer, that you have a, you put this unique designer dream in us and give us the courage to step into it. Help us to remember that Jesus taught that there is, you will settle accounts and you, do we have to give an account for what's been given to us? Help us to discover it and then help us to deploy it. My prayer, Lord, is that none of us will go to the grave with unused dreams but we will go empty. We will go empty. Father, I just thank you for this time to be together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.